Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Quiet Before, Capturing History Through Conversation. Um, I'm uh, Nancy Bulalakau. I'm the producer for the series. And I'm very excited to be here with the founders of the Asian American Writers Workshop. Um, Quiet Before is a series that uh, is looking at Asian American history through um, the, through conversations and through the lenses of the people who lived through these moments, uh, who write about them, who teach them. And uh, we're very excited today to have this conversation um, on the on the year of the 30th anniversary of the Asian American Writers Workshop. So we're here with uh, Bino Rey Aluyo, Christina Chu, Curtis Chin, and Marie Lee. Um, and we're going to start right at the beginning because I think that uh, the story hasn't been heard and, and the workshop has impacted so many writers and so many artists and it's really, um, it is an important institution for the community, uh, but it has its reach goes beyond the Asian American community. And I think that from my um, from my perspective as a former intern of the Asian American Writers Workshop, uh, that impact was really baked in from the start. Um, so we're just gonna get right into it. And uh, I'm gonna, throw it to Curtis and ask him to sort of start at the beginning and describe what the climate was like uh, at the time that the workshop first began. Uh, well, thank you, Nancy. Thank you for putting this together. And it's great to see all my old friends from, I can't believe it, 30 years ago. <laughs> um, you know, I'll take a slight step back and talk about, um, you know, how I personally arrived in New York and how that fits in with everybody else's journey too. And I'd love to hear theirs. Um, but I was born and raised in Detroit and one of the seminal events was actually uh, the Vincent Chin case, one of our family friends who had been murdered. And, you know, so I always had a strong sense of my Asian American identity. Uh, and I deliberately moved to New York, hoping to find a community of Asian American writers because I had gone through the writing program at the University of Michigan and, and felt very dissatisfied with being the only person of color, um, you know, in the program. And so uh, I was looking for it. Um, there was a group in existence called Basement Workshop, which I reached out to, but they were in a state of not being as much active. And so when I, you know, reached out to them and said, hey, I'd love to be a part of your group. They said more or less like, oh, why don't you start a new thing, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so, um, <laughs> I ran into a bunch of other writers, you know, like Bino and Christina and Marie and so many others who were thinking the same thing, I believe. And that's why we all we all individually just sort of came together, you know, with these different ideas. So. How did you all first meet? You know, I, met I already Curtis knew Christina. And, yeah, yeah. Oh, go ahead. I'll go ahead. Go ahead, Bino. Oh, Curtis and I met in 1990, actually, <laughs> a long time before the workshop was created. And I did not know he was a poet. I did not know he was a writer. And I met him not in a literary context. I met him in a gay context because we met. It was I quit my first job after college. And um, I was looking I was not looking for a literary community, although I had been writing for some time. And um, I was looking for the gay community. And I went to the center and I attended a meeting. A, a friend of mine told me you should attend a meeting with Gapimni. Gapimni is gay, Asian, Pacific Islander men of New York. And Curtis sat next to me in that meeting. And I will never forget that moment because Car Curtis made a comment about what I was wearing, which was, in a picture that I had when I went to Paris because I was coming back from France. And Curtis said, and, and then Curtis became a friend, but you know, he was a friend, a gay friend before he became a literary friend. And we had a voyage long before the workshop. I mean, it, it seemed like a year, but that year was a very, very long year for me. 
because I was already starting with activism and the 90s was really huge when it came to people who were coming out as activists, Asian American activists, gay activists because of AIDS. I was an act up activist actually before we met. And then one day I saw Curtis's poem and boom, there was a reveal. And then I, I think I, he told me he was writing poetry and that's how it began, but not thinking we would found an organization actually. That came out, you know, that came may, maybe a year later. And hello what to everyone, <laughs> sorry. What was the poem, oh, Dino? I remembered his entire collection. It, it was Mango. Yes. Ooh. Did you write about Mango? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then he wrote, he wrote about something um, about me making monkey signs on the subway. That I remember, it was in somebody's apartment. And then I asked him, did you just write about me? <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember uh, um, Curtis starting as a poet, actually, and I loved his work. That's a long time I don't ago. Think I've read, I, don't, I don't think I've read Curtis's poetry, which is strange. Um, I think maybe, Curtis, you have to send some over as soon as this is done taping, but that's, um, that's amazing. Um, Marie, you said that you and Christina already knew each other. Yes. So I had I had come to New York with definitely an idea that I wanted to be a writer and be close to publishing, but kind of to sort of placate my parents. I'd been working in an investment bank for five years. And when I met Christina, I had just taken the leap of leaving my job to write full time. And my parents are still really angry at me. And I kind of, I was kind of still inching towards, um, I don't know, like an Asian American identity. I didn't really know what was going on. And in fact, I had just sold my first young adult novel, which now 30 years later, people are calling the first Asian American like contemporary set YA novel, but I didn't really have an identity as an Asian American person. So I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just doing what I was doing. And so um, I knew Christina and she said, oh, I'm in this really new group and we go workshop our stuff. And I was just kind of cool. This is really interesting. I'll just go do it. Um, but I didn't really think of it in terms of this is something I'm looking for, or I didn't even really know, you know, I grew up in rural Minnesota, so I didn't really even have much um, of a vision of myself as an Asian American. And then just the rest of it was just such an interesting time for me to, to explore it really. And Christina, who here did you meet first? Oh, so uh, I met Marie first for sure. Oh, actually, no, that's not true. No. I, I met um, <laughs> Curtis and Dino first because um, I, so I was working at the Brooklyn Museum and I was trying to write and I saw a little ad in a newspaper or something and it said something about, um, are you Asian American and trying to be a writer? Come meet, come meet on such and such date. And I'm like, it was like, <laughs> Oh my God, was, how, how is this happening? How, how is this happening? And so I, I, I go and I meet them. And um, first of all, they were fabulous. So I was like, oh my God, and they look great too. <laughs> and, and so, and they were, um, and, and Curtis's work was, um, I think really, really moved me because they were both doing, Bino and Curtis were both doing poetry at the time. And their work was really incredible. And um, Curtis had just written a piece, I think it was called, um, Do You Dream in Chinese? Something like, it, it was titled something like that. And I just, I was so moved by that poem. And I was, I just thought these are, these are my, my people because I too had grown up in a white suburb and I never really had any sense of identity. If anything, it was negative. And I had um, been in writing workshops that were white and so it was always, it was a very different understanding of my work. And it wasn't until this workshop. So this was, it was at the very beginning of things. And then I meet Marie, it was like, like magic, you know, like magic is starting to happen because I meet Marie through my boyfriend um, and I, I can hardly believe it. Here's this 
like incredible person who had she was she had her, all her um what do you call those the, the blueprints um she had her galleys um of finding my voice and i got to read from the galleys i was so amazed i was like this like there's like god god is like like listening or something and um and so i was like marie um i i don't know if you'd be interested but i met these guys and i i think i think there's something and marie marie um, came with me and we we just started meeting as a group and we would share our work with each other it, it was just basically that simple initially and wow it was incredible it was incredible and initially i think there were some people and then all of a sudden a lot of people and then it trickled down to a core group um so i, I think that's sort of how things happened so can i ask really... that uh, that ad that you responded to was that in the village voice probably no, i was going to say no, that was in the poetry calendar. Oh, uh, oh yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. All the time. And yeah. I had this, I had the side gig at the YMCA, and um, because I was like a fellow fellowship student, I had to do all their like stuff, so I had to keep track of all of that. That's how I saw it. <laughs> but I will have to it say, it all happened really, creepy. really. The voice. <laughs> Sorry. I have to say it happened really, <laughs> really quickly. Hmm? It happened really quickly from, you know, from the time that Alvin and Bino and I, you know, said, oh, let's get together a few of our friends. And we met in a Greek diner for like, I think, two weeks. But then we quickly moved over. One of the members was a member of CAV, the Committee Against Anti-Asian Violence. And she offered up that space. And I think probably between that and, you know, a month into it, you know, Christina and Marie were already part of the group. So it's all very, very early. And as Christina mentioned, I think by the second month, we had so many people that we had to split into two sessions, like a Tuesday and a Thursday group, each with about, you know, 10 or a dozen people. So we had 20 people within the first couple of months, just from the poetry calendar ad. So I think that's showed that there was a real hunger for a group like this. So. Um, what made, so Bino and Curtis put the ad in poetry calendar. Is that is that right? Curtis, that was Curtis how, that did was a lot team. of that. Yeah, Curtis did a lot of that recruiting. I remember I remember that time because I said, he kept telling me we need to find more people, and I wondered why <laughs> we're not enough. <laughs> and it just started to expand. I mean, the the the, vill the Greenwich Village. Um, coffee shop, I remember very, I mean, that was like core first generation that disappeared really quickly. But there was somebody there that is a really big name person in Hollywood, you know? And oh, then I started, we started meeting with an, uh, who's that? Should you tell them, Curtis? <laughs> you Go ahead, you can. I don't think she's ashamed. <laughs> oh, I absolutely love Vina Cabrera Sud was a first generation and she's the producer of Cold Case. And and I remember vividly her poem called What You Want From Me, White Boy. That was <laughs> that was like a flagship right. poetry for recruitment. And we'd be, you know, she was wonderful at it. So you put the ad and then you had people respond and you were meeting at the Greek diner. And was it when you moved to CAV that you were able to then accommodate more uh, participants? Yes. Yeah. yeah, the Greek diner was really only just two times, I think. It really, I mean, so everybody says we met in a Greek diner and we did, but I think it was really only two times. And the other thing that we did beside the poetry calendar is that we loved going to the different readings too around town. Exactly. So anytime yes. we saw other Asians, we always stalked them and said, hey, you know, join our group. So, you know, that no, was Curtis, a very quick Curtis way. Curtis stopped them. <laughs> okay, I, Curtis is a a I got a lot of numbers. <laughs> yes. No, you know, specifically, I, got a lot of dates I remember us, we went to the Lee Young Lee reading, and then we just 
Curtis like, here, here's the flyer. Give it to anyone who looks Asian. So we were just kind of, <laughs> hey, <laughs> just giving it to people. It's grassroots and activism. Did that feel right? But did it feel <laughs> did it feel right to reach out to people yeah, I, because I think, they I think the energy was really great. I mean, I think people just gravitated to us too. Um, once, you know, it was it was just kind of like like a ball of energy and we were we a lot of us spend a lot of time together. So we would kind of like move together and people would kind of kind of come into this group and you know they'd be move in from the they'd start at the periphery and then they've they'd move in and um like and some people would would fall away like i remember mill young was very very um a huge part of the group and then uh, eventually she, you know she 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 made the decision to be more focus more on activism mm -hmm. and so you know so we had a lot of but there was a it was there was a lot of intersection between activism and writing which is really for me it was i had never really been around that before so it was just so good for me yeah i think a lot of but people were surprised to see it was like I think activism a lot of writing and friendship right A lot of, for me, it was a lot of activism. It was a lot of, without the activism, I don't think I would have survived. I, I don't think I would have created actually. But let me just mention that those little notes that Curtis had in his pocket, this was how we, we met Barbara Tran. Barbara Tran changed my life as a poet. I mean, it, it's, it was her, her work for me was instructive on how to write good poetry and her presence, because she was just, has always been a poetry goddess for me. It's, it's just so, it's like a light in the path, you know? It just changed everything. Curtis, you were gonna say something a moment ago. Yeah, I was going to say, um, when we first started going to readings together, and it was just Asian American readers, just any interesting writer uh, that was out there, we'd be this little pack of, you know, six, seven Asian Americans, you know, and I think that just sort of shocked people. It's like, what is this? What's going on here? You know, uh, <laughs> and I think what Christina was sort of talking about, and it was fun because we each recommended different writers. So we were learning, you know, you know as we were just growing as writers ourselves, we were being exposed to different writers that we might not have been on our own radar screen. And as Bino mentioned, like if we saw someone like a B, uh, Barbara Tron sitting by herself, we'd, we'd immediately pounce on her. And I remember her saying that she was scared at first. <laughs> but, you know, she checked in with a friend of hers named Lisa Simmons, who was also one of the people at our first oh. meeting. Um, yes, Lisa. They had to, they'd gone to NYU they together. Knew it, they knew each other. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And then that's when Barbara background checked us <laughs> to make sure that we nice. were legitimate uh, and uh, <laughs> too enthusiastic yeah. yeah 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 i remember marie when she came on board i was so scared of her because she was the published one <laughs> and i remember like who's why is she joining us <laughs> she's published already and I, you know it's so intimidating to have somebody published there You're but so then the funny. talents in the room were just tremendous you know it really was. It was spectacular. Marie, really did you want to say something? Yeah, I was just going to talk about my one of my first sort of published um, adult, like short fiction. It was so meaningful to me because it was about a Korean grocer and it was just a very small detail. Korean grocer gets killed in the end. And I just went, I just made all these permutations just to make sure, you know, it was like a white person who killed him and this and that and this and that. <laughs> And then just kind of because everyone kind of knew what, you know, I mean, like we're all Asian Americans, we all kind of got the deal. And then I can't remember, maybe it was Curtis or Bino said, come on, we don't have to, like you're straining so hard with us. Like it's not, it's not a big deal that you have to point out the race. And it ended up actually having a much more gentle ending. He ends up not getting shot actually. And then that ended up getting published. And it was just one of these things where I just felt like, because of my friends, they pushed, they pushed the piece to where it needed to go. 
And I mm. didn't find that in these other writers' workshops, particularly when it was just white people going, you need to have more rice in the background or something. It was just always this kind of resistance where here I just felt like, okay, you guys get what I'm trying to do. And it wasn't like, it wasn't prescriptive at all. It just, I just remember it pushing it right to where it needed to go. It was just such a neat feeling. I actually had a similar experience to Murray, um, except it was the opposite. Uh, Cause because I had um, been in this workshop, I ended up going to get my MFA at Columbia after. And, um, and so I already knew like what I needed to be clear, clearer about and what I really just didn't need to be clearer about. And I had written a, a story about um, the handover of Hong Kong and uh, in the story, um, you know, there's a gentleman who, who basically is, it's like handing over the new guard, right? You know, everything to the new guard. And, um, and the instruct, the facilitator I had um, teaching basically said, well, you know, I don't, I don't, the whole idea of the handover is like, like, I remember it being in the headlines, but like, you need to explain what that is. And I thought to myself, my friends would never have said that they would either have, if they didn't know what it was, they would have looked it up or they, you know, they, they just would never have done that. It would have been like trying to explain July 4th, you know? Uh, so then, so I, I had a real strong sense of who I was and, and what my writing could be before I got there. And so it was really helpful. Hmm. I didn't have an Asian American oh. identity actually when I met Curtis and um, because I was an, an, an kind of relatively new immigrant, I kind of es es uh, skipped Filipino American identity and just went into exploring Asian American identity. And um, I never really understood at that time all the issues that writers were having in their MFA programs because I never I never went to one. I was a foreign affairs graduate and I still to this day don't have an MFA. But I think being exposed to that kind of sensibility really, really helped in kind of forging an identity that I wasn't particularly familiar with because, you know, Filipino immigrants come to this country speaking English. And I remember in 1990, something was up in the air because that was the year the dog that Jessica Hagedorn was on the cover of the New York Times book review. And I thought, hmm, look at that. You know, something is happening. And it, it seems like things are aligning to just kind of move out to the, move us to that space of creating an organization that will sort of revolutionize the way we look at Asian American literature. And I had no idea that was happening, you know, because I just I was just there and having a great time with Christina Curtis and Marie, you know. So how That's did one that thing happen? That how did that, how thinking, did you make that shift? I just, uh, I think when you're with a group of people who, who are as young as you are and they're exploring all of it and you're listening and kind of internalizing all the, the craziness happening in writing workshops that I did not, I never went through. And I sort of like skipped an MFA, all the problems, and he just started writing, being accepted by the people within the workshop. So I never had to deal with what Christina mentioned, which I mean, I was really lucky about. And in 1995, decided I'm going to write a novel. And I did, just like that, and published it in 99. I mean, just like that, because I would not have published it if not for the workshop, because I finished it while being in the workshop. You know, we just we just did it. There's just so many things happening in the 90s that oh, it's just hard to to even point at one reason that pushed us there. I, I think it's just having a really supportive space for me, not even being conscious that it was supportive. I just love being there. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say ended, that. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Curtis. <laughs> okay. I was going to say that the one thing for me and um, that I, I like to think about is how much fun we had 
you know, yeah, we got a lot of writing done, you know, but I, and we did a lot of activism. We, we protested at so many things from AIDS to Miss Saigon to et cetera, et cetera. But um, the workshop was always just a fun space. And I think that's why we achieved so much so quickly. You know, as I mentioned, um, you know, within two to three months, uh, we were running multiple workshops, you know, and then we expanded to a theater workshop. And then within what within the first year, we published the Asian Pacific American Journal. Um, within a year and a half, we won a, a giant mm. award from the New York Community Trust to start giving out fellowships where we were giving out seven thousand dollars you know, plus mentors, um, editors, and agents, access to people like that. Um, Marie, you were one of the first mentors, I believe, you know, because we did the I four quarter four. Yeah. Um, you know, to advise, uh, you know, younger writers or people, even just our peers. Um, you know, we started doing the poetry caravan, which took poets around the country to college colleges. We had a national network through our newsletter of uh, regional representatives in about 15 or 20 cities, you know, in North America. I mean, and that was all done within the first two years, I believe, two, three years. I mean, it, it all mm. happened. And I think it's because we had an attitude of like, well, if you have an idea and you want to do it, hey, there are people around here, you know, who want to help and who may have also had the same idea. And, and that attitude and the fun that we had, it really was... I think it was just a great time. I mean, we did so much. And I think that's partly also because we were so young and we hadn't been yeah. jaded yet by the, uh, yes. you know, <laughs> by the world. So anyway, Marie. Yeah, I was just going to, I was just going to say besides, yes, I think laughter is kind of the abiding like um, image when I think about us hanging out together, but then also it kind of, I don't want it to obscure the more important things where, you know, for a lot of people, an MFA is not a, um, a viable option if you're working. I mean, a lot of people came to us, you know, who are lawyers or people just kind of tr thinking about being a writer. So this actually offered a space for people to get an MFA level, you know, education without having to do that. And that's such a big thing for a community of mm -hmm. color because we don't get to do the internship at the Paris Review where our parents pay for an apartment or whatever. Like this is, this is such an access thing and it was so much community based in terms of we weren't, it wasn't, oh, are you going to be a famous writer? A lot of it was come write, have fun, be silly. And yeah. just, you know, we had, I just remember someone going, well, who's your favorite Asian and American writer and going, him going, Erica Jong. <laughs> going, okay, I think you need to learn more about Asian American literature a little bit. And, but, but you know what I mean? That was the whole thing is that it wasn't all, oh, like here, here's all the people I've read and I'm so smart and my MFA, it was just kind of, yeah. And then we always had an office catch. And we're always eating stuff. And yeah. I think the nurturing um, that um, that we did for each other was, was, you just can't get that anywhere, especially if you're a person of color. And um, the, the care that we, and respect we had for each other. I mean, I, I think there were different levels of, of writers at that point. Like, I, I just remember being, awed by these these other people and I was just sort of closer to the beginning of writing and um and I knew I had so much to learn and they could so easily have been like nice try you know but they were like they just really helped you know they just really told me look honestly you know, you need to think about this, you need to think about art, you need to think about, you know, and, 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 and so there was this trust that, that you just didn't get anywhere else, you know, and, 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 and so far, I have not found a group that I trust um, the way mm. I, I did our group. You know, um, one thing so I would say about, right, I'm just gonna say in, I, jo I, became an intern for Curtis in 1995. And um, everything that you're talking about, um, that continue, continued on in the feeling of the space. And I think that as a, as a public program uh, director and a coordinator, I've always changed the feeling that the workshop had that was um, inclusive and exactly that, that there was no judgment that the door was always open to somebody who had 
never written a single word of fiction or poetry or somebody who was already established like Hanong or, or Jessica Hagedorn. And I think that it was really a magical time um, and that it happened in a physical space that is so hard to do. Um, and, and I've never seen anything like that. Hmm. So I, I'd love to, I'd love to hear because those that's, that it, it's hard, it's hard to find a space. It's hard to make the rent. It's hard to get not-for-profit status. It's hard to manage people. Um, so what you're talking about, I can still feel that feeling coming from all of you that you had this friendship and it, and it really birthed so much. Um, but how did you know how to do those, those, the nuts and bolts of creating an organization and opening up, not just to a circle of friends, but to, you know, the, the city and, and beyond that. I mean, I can say from my experience, I mean, I had some activism in college, you know, working with the student groups um, and founding a literary magazine for people of color. Um, that's something I started on campus. So I had to do some fundraising. And from there, I got two internships. That's actually what brought me to New York City. I had an internship at both the Chinatown History Project, which is now called the Museum of Chinese in America, and um, Pan Asian Repertory Theater. And I was their development intern. So I was basically fundraising for them. And after the summer, they both offered me jobs, which is great. I mean, um, and so I, I was in the nonprofit sphere. I had that admin experience. Um, the first reading that I personally organized was an Asian American women's reading at, at the History Project um, for an anthology. So that, that's where, you know, my personal background was. But I think all of us brought some skill set, right? whether it was in publishing or networking or Marie was great at financial stuff. I mean, you know, that really helped because I'm not a numbers person, but yeah. So that was my take, but. Yeah, I, I just remember also, the, Oh, go ahead. No, Marie, go ahead. Oh, about financial stuff though. I just remember kind of creeping along in terms of, you know, now we have to do this, or this is what 501c3 organization does. And then I remember at one point, so I was the board president going, oh, wait, we're financially liable for this organization? I just remember going, <laughs> oh, oh, interesting. And that was something that never happened to me in all my time when I was working on Wall Street and being so sophisticated about money. So that's all I want to say. Yeah, I, and I, I also a lot think of that... What, what, Curtis? I was going to say, Marie had a lot of contacts to um, people who are, who are more well off than us artists. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> but I, I think one of the magic th magical things about um, the workshop was that we, were, that we had a whole bunch of creatives with a lot of ideas. And so we'd be sitting together and we'd be like, wouldn't it be great if we had a journal? And then so like, yeah, let's do a journal. <laughs> and then wouldn't it be great if it was, if we had a space where we could, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had a reading? Or what, what about a series of readings? You know? And so like everything kind of like, we took this step here and it was like, we would work out and be like, well, let's do more. Let's, let's do this, let's do that. And it just kept growing and, you know, and become, turning into this multifaceted organization is really incredible. Yeah, I, I remember Curtis and, and Marie actually spearheading the whole becoming uh, a nonprofit thing. I knew absolutely nothing about that. So I stayed out of it. I, I, I remember signing a lot of forms. I had no idea why, why I was signing them, you know, <laughs> and um, they also had a change of name because I didn't use my legal name. So I thought I was safe signing all of that stuff. <laughs> but um, <laughs> But we, you know, I had a full-time job and I remember having um, a board meeting at the New York City Commission on Human Rights. So, you know, I did a lot of stuff in my office, especially folding little brochures. I remember vividly the, po the poetry caravan, it said to the court is, listen, I want to start a caravan and I'm calling it 
poetry caravan or, or something like that. And, you know, just like little ideas that no one ever, ever says to you, oh, that's a bad idea. We just all agree to it. And then it just turns into something, you know. And then before you knew it, we were all driving to Boston <laughs> for, for whatever reason it was, you know, that whole 10 years from 1991 to the year 2000 was so exhausting. I mean, if I had to really go back and look at my CV of what I did in the first 10 years of the workshop, I had two pages because we did so, and I actually kept a tag, like, where are we going? Whatever. Just so many things that we did. It was a lot of fun. It's kind of like what friends do. It's not what founders of organizations do. It's like what friends do that, you know, we're all looking back now and saying to ourselves, oh, we actually did that, didn't we? You know? Yeah, and, and, I think and also we had nothing to lose. Yeah. yeah, we had, yes, we had... absolutely. And so by the way, like, because oh, of yeah, the climate um... at that time, it was a really, what, really you know? depressing climate. The, the, the times where we were living in was really, really depressing. So I think in so many ways, it was like an antidote to AIDS or anti-Asian violence. There's a lot about anti-Asian violence in the 90s. Thanks to um, Committee Against Anti-Asian Violence, you know, we attended meetings all the time. And every single time we were marching in the street against police brutality, you know. Like what's happening now, it's sort of this mirror of 1991 almost you know i would also say at that time um it was also the the right wing that was defunding the arts at that time and that's something Newt that we're, we we yeah yes. it was not an easy time to start an arts organization i will say that you know and i um we, i don't know how we did it but um you know it was not an easy time there were so many things that said oh your group would not succeed right? Whether it's because people didn't fund Asian American arts organizations back then. People actually didn't fund literary organizations because the big groups that got all the support were all the theater, you know, the opera, you know, the dance troops, you know, very few people fund literary programs. And yet somehow we cobbled together that support, both from, you know, our community, but also, you know, finding enough sponsors here and there that believed in our mission and that a bunch of 20 something year old Asian Americans had a good idea that was worth investing in. And so, um, yeah, uh, there were a lot of challenges. It wasn't, it wasn't easy. I don't want to, you know, we look back at it and say it was fun, but I think we also have to pat ourselves on the back and said, you know what, we did something great in a very, very difficult time. It wasn't easy as Bino said. So. Yeah, I did think that you guys were pretty darn incredible because um, I didn't know the first thing about finances at all. And I do remember Marie saying, you do realize that we're financially liable. And I thought to myself, <laughs> well, I have no money, so who cares? <laughs> I always thought you were rich, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> I was on oh, a so... <laughs> You guys remember we needed somebody for the journal and my late friend Gordon Cato was a very prominent Asian um, agent at the time. He was at ICM. And so I remember strong arming him. It was basically, I just wouldn't listen to him going, I don't have any time. I don't want to do this. I hate Asian American stuff. I was just like, okay, okay, come on, Gordon. And just shanghaiing him into the journal. And he grumbled about it for years, but he ended up liking it. But for, for more, for other things, I don't see myself being so um, aggressive, but it was one of these things like we just needed him so badly. So I ended up just like pulling him into it. And it was, I think we all did that when there was a need for something, we just did it somehow. And a lot of it was very awkward because I couldn't see doing that to somebody today. I think we call, all about, called in a lot of things. Can you talk about how the board formed? Well, first we just grabbed everybody no. who was there. <laughs> first there was just that. That's not a good way to form a board when we're all writers. It's like, oh wait, who's there? There's just the four of us. Grab everybody. And then it Curtis made it more professional. We sort of made there's more diversity in the board. I thought that was yeah, like, I'm, Curtis, yeah. like finding people. 
Well, the, the founding of the board actually was one of the um, transition points of our organization because before we were just a grassroots, loosey goosey, we all did whatever, right? Um, and then we knew that if we, you know, I knew that if we wanted access to larger monies, like to be able to give fellowships and to publish books, we needed to get nonprofit money, right? And so we, um, as all good egalitarian activist socialist groups do, we, wanted to take a vote. And actually it led to some dissension. That was the first dissension yes, in our group right. because we had a meeting at the Vietnamese restaurant in Chinatown where right. we had about 20 or 30 of our members show up and we took a vote saying, should we become a nonprofit or not? Because we wanted the whole membership to have a say. And we voted and you know, I think by two to third people said, let's do it. But there was a strong element that said, no, we like the grassroots feel. We don't want a power structure. Yeah. My attitude about that is that, well, when you say you don't want a power structure, it actually creates a power structure, a de facto one that you just don't acknowledge. At least there's accountability and transparency when you do have a formal structure. But what we did was we said that anybody in this room out of the 30 people that want to be on the board, you can be on the board. It's that official, you know, uh, it's that open. And um, but we told people wow. what the responsibilities were including being financially <laughs> responsible. <laughs> and so you know, the only people that agreed to it were the four of us, along with Juliana Chang, you know, who is an academic now. Um, but we agreed. And then in terms of fleshing out the board, again, um, one of the things I did at Pan Asian Rep was I was the board liaison, the board development person. So I understood that, you know, to have a board, you need a certain competency level, but you also need to, to target it so that it fits the demographics of who you're serving, but also, you know, has the, um, you know, uh, uh, experience with the things that you need. So I invited my friend Ed Boland, you know, who was the first white guy part of our group, but he was a, fun, a professional fundraiser. And so he's helped us. And Ed is actually now a, a, a published writer too himself. Um, yeah. And then Marie, you actually put together the rest of the board, not me. I've always felt that the board was your baby because you brought on, you know, um, you know, oh, the first Alan wave of other people. people. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then you also brought on, um, well, Cindy Gitter came through you, right? Because she was the editor at Simon & Schuster. Before that, there was Rob, there was, um, wait, who else was there? I just remember them being mostly people you knew on the board, because I had to be introduced to them through you. Do you remember who else you invited to be on the board? I don't remember no, I vaguely feel like Mary Kim's husband was on the board, but not, he, I don't think he was. I don't, these are just so vague, but these are people was I was not Kim close to. Oh, you Mary know, maybe, Kim I think was, Mary was on the board for a little while. And Michael Mary e, was an he was at, yeah. Icon. Yes, and exactly. Michael Yee was a lawyer, you know, and Michael yeah, Yee so was I, a great, yeah. He was he someone was a I really met awesome a lot of Korean American person. activism. Yes, he was really good. He was very professional yeah. too. Yes, and he was very, very invested uh, in our, in the work that we do. So I, a big shout out to Michael who really, you yeah. know, was instrumental us in, in those early years. So, so For many someone people. Someone who's not a writer, like he's not a writer at all, but he just really supported what we were doing. I wouldn't be surprised if he has hopes underneath. Possibly. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah. We should support him. So Marie, who are all on the board and you started to bring other people on, but then Curtis, uh, you decided that Curtis would be the first executive director? I think that was pretty obvious. I felt like we were just this weird amorphous mass, like those fire ants that are on a raft that's just going somewhere. I really felt like without Curtis, like kind of giving us a direction, we would just have drifted forever. Cause we had vague ideas what we wanted to do, but I think probably because Curtis has had already had some experience in nonprofit. Jimmy, like I was an investment banker for five years. What do I know about any of that? So at least he had a vision and then just kind of like an infrastructure to work with. The rest of us were just, you know, we're writers and we had no idea what was going on pretty much. I don't think they, I don't think the workshop would exist without Curtis. I don't. Yeah, and I do want yeah, to point out a yeah. lot of people were very yeah. angry about us incorporating. There were some people who were super angry about it. And that I had kind of forgotten about it, like really just angry. But then it was sort of like, everyone wants to be a board member, you're financially liable. 
And then it was just like 26 people like step back. <laughs> I'm just sitting there. <laughs> That's pretty much what it was. Yeah, we had to we had to um, refund some donations to people. People had given us yeah, people got really mad. That's yeah, just they were like, no, that. if you're going to become an organization, yeah. we want our money back. And we're like, oh, okay, we already spent. I mean, because by then we'd already published the journal. We published the Korean American Journal. You know, we'd already done some stuff, but those people suddenly now wanted their grassroots donation money back and so we did have to do that but going back to that point you know like i th i don't think any i don't think the workshop would have existed today without any of us i mean i honestly believe that yes i brought certain things to the table but marie without a board without a strong board working together you know providing that long-term you know um you know uh what is the term for it? Guidance, but no, I mean, you know, just making sure that everything's honest and above board and that, you know, like we're filing all of our paperwork, you know, you, a group cannot succeed without that, you know, and without, you know, Bino and Christina really pushing the journal and all the programming, because I didn't have much time to organize the, the creative stuff. I didn't have time to put together the events. And that's where they came in, along with the other people, you know, who had joined the group, you know, people like Ed Lynn, you know, uh, who was a big part of the group back then, um, Barbara, you know, all these other people, you know, who were organizing the events. I don't, you know, you can't exist without any of those three parts, right? You need the people organizing the events, you need the people uh, applying for the money, and you need the three, and you need the people watching over that money and making sure that it's, you know, responsible. So I really feel like it was a team effort. So. I would love to hear a little bit more about that dissenting membership. Um, and then I would also love to hear about that second tier of, um, of colleagues, the maybe the first staff, uh, like Eric Gamalinda, and um, was he the first publications director? Or Bino and Christina, you pushed forward the the journal and the publishing arm. How did how did that how did that come about? Well, I think the first journal we had was um, in the heart, and the um, heart. It, it was the perfect first journal to have. I think because it really captured our heart. I mean, where we were at, and it, you know, we had just. Didn't we have a, a, a Beulah San um, reading? And we were all, we all felt so strongly about it. And so by doing this journal, it became kind of like the impetus to keep doing, like keep doing it. And so yeah. we just kept doing them. And there's also something you know about that joy that's kind of different from the way we think about Asian America, because I think that was the first time we decided to include the word Pacific in it. It's called okay. APA Journal. It was not called the Asian American Journal. I mean, the, it, internally, the, the, the conversations about diversity within Asian America began. I mean, if you look at all of us, we're all kind of different backgrounds, you know. I have, a, I had an, I always had an immigrant status and immigrant input into all of this while at the same time becoming more and more asian american because you know i'm because of them you know the other journals there was the korean american journal who would have thought of that you know and, and there's i remember the 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 gay issue you remember curtis the gay issue and the whole thing was put together by friends and the cover of that was done by kendall henry you know and he created a cover. We had we asked people to do it, and he was the one who created it. And I remember traveling with Ken Chu to a, a printer. Ken Chu, the artist, we went to a printer and found a printer for the, the, the for in the heart, just just like that, and and made made that happen. And we it was, it, it's um it's my first published work in the United States. And we were all in it. It's, it's, it's kind of like, here are all my friends from that era. And yeah, we all decided to put our names on the cover. <laughs> our names are the cover, you know? But it was such a beautiful thing. I, I kept that issue. I still have it. 
I had Why that you issue hold it too. Up? Hold it up. Huh? Do you have a copy? Is it one of you? I don't have it here. It... I, I, it's in New Jersey. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, the one thing I'll say about it was that that first journal, uh, we made it an open open policy. Anybody who was part of the workshop could submit if they want. Again, it was that open attitude that we had about it. I think by the second one, where we started getting inundated, because we, were, we managed to place it in bookstores like St. Mark's Bookstore and other places. And so people were now co contacting us who wanted to get published. So we were starting to get submissions. And that's when we established that ed editorial board. Um, do you guys remember Sumi Kwan and Julie Koo? Yes. yes. You know, and Julie Koo, they were really, yes. yeah, they I remember, really took I remember over. interviewing them. I remember interviewing them like, and they were not much younger than, than us. And I thought they were kids, you know, <laughs> they were like probably like two years or junior. And, you know, I just thought like, oh, we're interviewing these young people who, and they, I think <laughs> they were both Ivy Leaguers, weren't they? <laughs> Yeah, one had graduated from Yale and the other one had come from Harvard. But you're right, we had a they whole new hire. <laughs> well, because we had so many people that also came to us and said, hey, I want to edit your journal, right? People that we didn't know. And so you guys had to interview all these people. And Anna Bondock joined your board, I remember. She's yeah. an early name from the beginning, you know. Um, so yeah, so those were the original, you know, people. And then the books started coming about what was the first book we did? Was it Contours of the Heart, the South Asian anthology? Was that the first book? Hmm. Was because uh, Rajini Srikanth and Sunai Namara, who had been, you know, parts of our writing workshop, said, hey, we have an idea for an anthology. And then we said, oh, okay, well, we'll help you publish it. We'd never done a book before. And that book went on to win the American Book Award. I mean, it's, a, it's mm -hmm. an incredible book. Um, but what other, was that the first book we did? Or was it the Filipino book that we did? Oh, they came out at the same time, the two of them. They came out at the same time. You know, Flippin. Do you remember Flippin? Oh, Flippin. Yeah. Yes. Nice. Wow. Yeah, the first two wow. books came out because at that time there was a lack of South Asian and Filipino American books in publication, uh, in, pre in print. So we felt like it was important to get more of those writers, you know, um, into a book. By that time, we'd done special issues of the journal, focusing on gay and lesbian writings and also Korean American writing. But those were the first two that were like separate books. But we didn't have a separate publications director, Nancy. Uh -huh. We just did books. Whoever came to us and said, hey, I want to do a book. <laughs> we said, OK, well, you know, if you're willing to do this, we'll do this part. And we just said yes. We didn't really have a editorial policy of saying yes or no. It was just, yeah. I think yes. what was really beautiful about it was that we would have all these um, like journals that kind of showed the outer world how diverse we truly were. Like we didn't have just one face. So that was really great. So when did Eric join and Eileen and and then was Tina part of the the publishing arm? Got Tina so many Jane. names. Um, it's like we got to clean out the cobwebs. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. I, I remember both of them. I remember Eileen and and um, Eric joining. I don't remember but 94, 95? I think I think um, Curtis was already a staffer when they came, because we were, we were formalized, you know. And Eileen became an, an editor of the APA Journal, I remember, but I don't remember exactly and when. Part of the journal too, right? And Who are some of the famous um, yeah. editors? We had a lot of famous and, people, like well-respected writers. Don't forget, Hanya, Hanya took over. Yeah, Hanya was the also Yana Gihara. Yeah, you big know. writers. Big writers. Um, who also interned with the workshop too. Um, but I'm just trying to think, because I, I think of these things in terms of physical space, like when we moved from CAV to the Asian American Arts Alliance, to the office on um, Elizabeth Street, and then finally to our own place on St. Mark's, right? So that's how I sort of remember people. Like I picture, were they in that space or not, you know? Yeah. 
Um, but Tina joined on, um, you know, through the workshops. That's how that that was sort of like the starter drug for everybody. They take a workshop with us and then they volunteer after that. But she became the editor of our newsletter called Explanation. Her and Matthew, the two of them uh, did that. Um, you know, but it was very diverse. You know, um, I, I, it crossed my mind. We actually had like a very diverse representation. We had, you know, people from different ethnicities, but also we had adopted Koreans. We had a lot of adopted Koreans in our group. We had uh -huh. African American biracial people as parts of our group. It was a very, very uh, diverse group. Uh -huh. um, you know, but I think Eric and and um, I think Eric and uh, Eileen may have did they join towards the tail end of the elizabeth space or were they part of directly with st mark's space i can't remember i see them in the st mark's space only <clears throat> yeah i don't think they were okay. there that early but i also wanted to okay. add a ps that i have this very vague memory that i'm pretty sure is accurate that monique's first piece that she submitted to the journal for the vietnamese american journal um, issue was rejected but she found that she found it within her to persist. And just this idea of, you know, basically when someone becomes like pretty, you know, like well known or mainstream, it's because they've survived the gatekeeping process. So I think that was the workshop has been so helpful in keeping us sort of alive and motivated so we could fight the gatekeeping process versus, you know, people just become famous or people appreciate their work. Cause I don't, that's not how it works at all. And so I just want to point out that, that the workshop has always and still does serve that very important purpose of kind of being a safe space to nurture people so they can just kind of, you know, go on to fight the mainstream publishing industry or whatever. Yeah. Gene you know, so Clark was published in the New Eurasian Anthology. And I remember when I edited New Eurasian that I, I um, I took Henry Chang's work and I really, really loved it. That's before he published his book. That was in 1999, you know, and I don't know when his first kind of Chinatown thriller came out, yeah. but I remember that, you know, that he was already writing then at that time. I especially remember Jean Kwok because I think that's before she moved to the Netherlands when we published her, when she came back, she was already, you know, this big name author and she, she came back to the workshop and I, I introduced her and, and, and she, I think she mentioned that, you know, she thanked us for actually publishing her first or something like that. I hope I didn't get it wrong. So there were so many of them that came through the, you know, that kind of route that, that created by the workshop. Mm -hmm. Did you ever imagine that the workshop would have this like national footprint and be what it is now back then? Like, did you have dreams that way? Hmm. I do remember I, you know, joking that it's funny. Oh. Go ahead, no, go ahead Christina. Christina, you can go and then oh. I'll tell my little anecdote about the bookstore. Okay, so I um so I remember when my book came out. It came out in two thousand one, my first book, and um and I was still thinking like I wish everyone knew what the workshop um, was, right? Like, it's people knew about it, but they didn't know about it the way they know about it now, right? And so I was talking to my editor, and I said, "Can I put that in my bio?" that you know um the, the workshop in the bio and she's like yeah that's yeah you could do that so i put it in the bio and um so everyone at, would ask me what's that and i then i would have a chance to tell them <laughs> so that was um that was really great i mean i i feel like now um uh, i don't even know if i would be able to get an internship you know what i mean <laughs> You it's know, very it's treasured like, among my students. Yes, the Asian American Writers right. Workshop is the big prestigious internship now. But I, I was just going to mention too, I don't think we ever had this idea of what, how big it was going to get or even how enduring. It was more, I just remember joking because we were good at filling niches. And one of the things we did is we had an Asian American bookstore. And then we'd be like, 
we have the only Asian American bookstore in the nation. And that just became our big tagline, even though it was, you know, it was just our corner, but it was true. And so we never, you know what I mean? We kind of grew into that, but it, we never had this idea that it was going to be as big as it is now. At least I didn't. I think you're right about that, Marie. I think that the way we operated was that we asked in, individually, we all personally felt a need for these things as writers. We felt like, oh, we wanted to read more. So let's create that opportunity for ourselves. We need to publish more. Let's create that opportunity uh, for ourselves. And I think the reason the group grew so big was because there was so much need out there. So it's not like we planned it, but I think we just naturally filled in to the spaces where where we weren't invited, you know that that there needed to be uh, um, somebody doing this kind of stuff. And you mentioned the bookstore, and yeah, it was you know a, by token a small bookstore, but we had several hundred, we had over a thousand titles in that bookstore, and the number of writers that um, I think that they felt so great that because nobody else would carry them. Like a lot of these Asian American writers that were you know self published or published through small presses. They could tell somebody like, oh, if you want to buy my book, if you're in New York, you can go to the writer's workshop. And that stamp of approval, I think, really sometimes carries you along, knowing that somebody cares enough to carry your book, you know, to make it available to other people. And it's just those little touches that, you know, I think, you know, made people like us. They just felt like, oh, thank you. Thank you for providing this. Thank you for recognizing my work. And I think that, you know, that's probably why we grew so much there was because you know there were so many people out there that needed the work that we were doing so and it was so accessible right i i think um you know now the workshop has a this beautiful space but it's kind of like you have to jump in an elevator and you need a code and there was none of that when we were doing it it was just people just just came in like we didn't gatekeep and we didn't, you know, and it was free flowing and people came, people went, it was, hmm. it was really, and it was the fact that it was like on the street, the, the gap um, place in particular, like the, it was on the street. Every, we all knew like if who was there, <laughs> what was going on. If, you know, if anything was happening, we all knew we would all start showing up and the workshop's name is actually bigger than the imagined space. You know, I, I, I used to get emails from people asking me, could I, can I read at the workshop, you know, even though I, I, I didn't work there. And then they imagined this workshop because of its reputation. It's like Jacob Javits, you know, and they, <laughs> they end up going into this, they have to end up going to this small elevator, going to the second floor. And they're like, oh, so this is a community space. It's, it's interesting what, how reputable it is now. You know, I, I remember when I was telling Curtis and I said to him, I do not like that name because when you spell it out, um, they're, they're, the W looked like fangs. And I said to him, look, because I love to draw, I would draw it for him. It's like, these are fangs. <laughs> <laughs> and Curtis said, don't worry, don't worry, we'll change the name. And he never changed the name. So it kind of got stuck, you know? You know, the whole kind of naming process of the work, because for me, it was like, really, you're going to call uh, an organization with a generic Asian American, you know, and I said, I want it to be called North, South or East, West or whatever, you know, what, whatever. <laughs> well, so I, I have two questions. The what I wanted to go back to when you talked about voting on whether the workshop should uh, uh, become official. Um, you had a membership, a membership structure. So people pay, did they pay membership on a monthly basis? No. How did that, how did that group, what did they sort of, uh, transition to when the workshop became more official? I think it just well, left. <laughs> a few of those people, a few of those people who were most vocal about it left. They they just stopped showing up to our workshop. The majority of the people continued just attending our workshop and just let they I don't know if they were unhappy or happy that we decided to just move in this direction, but they were still happy enough to continue being part of the workshop, 
you know, and then they just let the five of us or the four of us, you know, continue doing the behind the scenes of, you know, applying for grants, you know, making sure that we were registered with the right government agencies, making sure that our board was filled out with people with the right legal and financial expertise. They just sort of, you know, they didn't pay attention. They just still, you know, enjoyed the, the, the fruits of the labor that was being put in, you know, but a few people did leave, um, you know, uh, upset at us about it. But I hope that in, in, you know, in time, and I think I did hear that, you know, many of them recognized that this was the right strategy. I think what they were afraid of was that we would lose that community spirit, you know, that idea that anybody could just walk into the door and be part of the group. But, you know, um, given that that happened in 91, 92, when we went through the paperwork, and even by 95, Nancy, when you said that you joined, you still felt that we had that open community space, showed that we really did try to continue that as best as we could with still being financially responsible, you know, and legally responsible for, you know, things, so. So my second question is about the, the climate of that time and that there are other organizations, you know, that you referenced like CAV um, and then Pan-Asian Rep, um, uh, uh, the Asian American Arts Alliance. Um, it seems as if a number of Asian American organizations sort of formed in that time and have also uh, continued on and are probably in their 30 year, 30 plus year anniversary. Did you have a sense of that? Did you have relationships with those groups and, um, do you have a, a do you have thoughts around um, why that? I mean, you've you've touched on on why the workshop bloomed in that time, um, but was there collaboration or uh, an understanding of what each other was doing? I can speak to um, the birth or the maybe the growth of the LGBTQ Asian American movement at that time. When, when Curtis and I were, you know, kind of toying with the idea of even writing poetry, because when I met him, I, I mentioned earlier in, the, in 1990, I was actually very much a part of the, the gay community. That's, that's where I started my activism. At the same time, a Korean gay group started. I actually founded uh, Filipino American lesbian gay group. If you remember Curtis Kambasaluso, and that's where I put all my energy because Curtis was, you know, the visionary doing the the workshop, and I, I thought, well, I can write, you know, with the workshop and focus my activism here. But all of these, the and the and Salga, if you remember South Asian South Asian lesbian gay, which is, still exists. And um, Kambal, the, the Filipino group, um, we did not, you know, I think four years later, we stopped organizing. In 91, we marched in the gay and lesbian community because of May Saigon in such a force that they had never seen Asian Americans like that in the gay march in New York City. And we had Gayzilla. Gayzilla is Godzilla, but gay. And we had the biggest and Ken Chu and the great Paul Pfeiffer and Ming Cho created this huge Godzilla marching down the street. And this was happening at the same time that the workshop and, and people in the workshop were creating works. It was, and I have pictures <laughs> and I remember them, you know, that was the climate. And I, I'm not sure whether it was a reaction to AIDS reaction to invisibility, it's, it's definitely a desire to come out of the shell in so many ways. Is that how Godzilla formed? Is that why the art group Godzilla forms? Godzilla, of yes, that? yes. So Godzilla, was Godzilla founded by Ken Chu? It was, wasn't it? Yes, mm -hmm. that, that, that actually group happened at, you know, at, this, at that time. And then they create, so they called it Godzilla, that big um, thing. 
Yeah, we were definitely tied in with all these uh, queer activist groups, um, you know, but, you know, one group that I feel like we, we haven't mentioned, which, which did have an impact with us is, is A Magazine, a group that we shared an office ah. with uh, at Elizabeth Street, because we shared a lot of the writers and Jeff Yang, the editor and, and founder of A Magazine was my roommate uh, oh. at the time. And the two of us would oftentimes, frankly, stay up at night talking about strategies about like helping each other's publication because i was volunteering for a magazine and he was you know showing up to some of our workshops and so i think it was great having someone like that for me personally to uh sound ideas off of like you know in terms of the community contacts etc cetera, etc cetera. um but i think that a magazine um you know uh was was a good partner for us um, as were all the other groups that supported us early on. Um, we've mentioned CAV, Asian American Arts Alliance with Amy Chu. When she was the head, she offered us a free space to meet there and a free filing cabinet. I don't know if you guys remember, they gave us one little, one of those half, not even yeah. a full filing cabinet, half size. They said, okay, you can have this one, you can have this one drawer. Um, but so many groups really came out and offered assistance to us, you know. And then that's partly why when we opened up that space on St. Mark's, we had that incubator space where groups like Cami Lee Foundation, NATCO, the National Asian American Theater Company, um, you know, they rented space from us. Um, and so we, we liked having that community feel um, and bringing in other partners. Uh, so that always that, that was always a big part of, of our identity was like, you know, supporting the whole ecosystem of, of Asian Americans. Marie or Christina, do you have um, any thoughts on the other organizations that that the Writers Workshop collaborated with? I was just going to talk about a magazine because um, I I remember a lot of the times we when we were finishing up work. Sometimes it wouldn't just be us; it would be a lot of them also, mm. and we would all go and you know go to dojos or what, and we'd be like taking mm -hmm. up the whole table, and um, and that was really fun. That I mean, it was just so nice to get to know all these other people, and and there were all these intersections, you know, because everyone was involved with something else, right? And I also have an identical twin, and she was very involved with CAV and very, you know, so it was, so it, it was like, you just knew everything that was happening if you, if you plugged in anywhere, you know, so mm. that was really amazing. And I think for me, I learned a lot because I wasn't a particularly act, active person um, before I met this group. Mm. I think for me personally, um, when we first were meeting at CAV was was really such an eye opener for me. What's funny is now looking back at a lot of my YA novels, a lot of people go, how come there's always like some violent incident that happens in them, you know, but now I'm seeing particularly now that, you know, because of this, the model minority stereotype, a lot of physical violence against Asians becomes so glossed over. And then just, you know, the CAV newsletter and seeing, I don't know, just like the different movements, like for the taxi drivers and so forth. To me, just, you know, coming from the Midwest and feeling like always gaslighting myself, like, did that really happen to me? Maybe that wasn't Asian American. That reified for me so much. Um, so, so much actually that when um, Columbia did a, like an anti-Asian like forum um, and I was one of the people on the panel, um, I actually asked Bino and Curtis if they had any archival materials. Bino had this great, like a, just like a newsletter from CAV. And it was just incredible to see how it could have been today. Um, there was some artist who was just killed by these thugs in Times Square. He was just like painting a picture. And then it was just sort of like, police are not sure if it's a hate crime. And well, maybe we'll ad adjust the law a little bit. You know, you could already see the inaction. And just to see how little that has changed in 30 years um, mm -hmm. has just, it's just was really, shockingly you know like moving to me to see that we actually have not moved that much and that so much mm -hmm. of this is there and it also just reifies again that art is political and creating art is is one way that we push against something like you know the amount of anti-asian violence that's going on right now 
do you feel um, that there's been progress since then? How do you feel it's different today than it was then? If it is. Well, I think, I think um, you know, I think it hasn't, it's not so different for us because we've always known, but I think, um, you know, you get to a breaking point, right? And I think, I don't know about you guys, but I have a lot of white peers that were shocked about Atlanta. And I, <laughs> I just was kind of like, well, um, glad to know that you're awake now, you know, uh, because we've, we've certainly known that the violence has been there this whole time. And, you know, you never know if something's going to happen. So, you know, you always are what expected to be on guard. I, you know, so I think people really understand that differently now. And maybe part of that is because of social media, uh, because now if something happens, people spread the news. Um, but I don't think that things have changed. <laughs> I, I don't know about you guys, which is really disturbing to me. It is, it's very, no, very think... disturbing because I remember I was texting my mother and telling her not to leave our house in New Jersey, you know, what, and I would text her every day. I said, I would, I would tell her like, if you leave the house, wear a mask and put something on your face so nobody could recognize you. It's kind of shocking. It, and then it brings you back like 30 years ago when we were marching in the street. How could it possibly, I mean, Curtis did this great documentary on Vincent Chin, Vincent Ho, and people there could not, you know, they had no idea who Vincent Chin was. And now they're creating a, a movie about, around, you know, I, I mean, in one way, I'm, I'm glad that they're bringing back these um, important personalities that from 30 years ago, at the same time, I just cannot believe we're still here. You know, I just, I don't know. I mean, it's so much in the open now. Every single time there's a violence, you see it on, on, on social media. It's so public. Before, we had to beg people to publish us. 30 years ago, no one would cover these things. It was a CAV newsletter. Now it's all over and you don't know why it's, has it always been there? Like different generation, same sensibility, same racism, who knows, you know? I think the outside uh, of our community has changed, but maybe not as fast as, as we would like it to, because there's still a lot of xenophobia, um, you know, and anti-Asian sentiment. But I will say that I think what has changed is our community. And I think that for me is the bright spot, is seeing our community being much more vocal, people recognizing these things much faster. We still have a long way to go as a community to pull together to support one another you know, across our different ethnicities, but I think we're getting better at it. And I think people are understanding this term Asian American a bit more. I think when we wow. first started 30 years ago, there was still a question of this term Asian American. What does it mean? You know, um, it just wasn't as strong, at least to outsiders too. But I think this term Asian American has come a long way in 30 years, and that therefore makes our work a little bit easier. And, you know, um, I think that hopefully with these recent tragedies, every recent tragedy, I hope that that you know it um, propels us to uh, figure out how we can work together, how we can like combat this thing as a as a full community. And so, in that sense, I feel like there has been change. Things are different, but the majority of that change has come from within, and maybe that's that's better because that makes us stronger in the long run to tackle all these other issues too. So um, we're approaching our last 20 minutes. Um, and I'd like to ask um, that maybe if you could each take a turn and share either a person or an event or a piece of work that came out of the workshop that stays with you very clearly now and um, impacted your life or your work, and or your work. Um, you can, I'll, I'll share something really quick while you think on that. Uh, the way that I came to stay at the workshop was because 
Curtis um, invited me and the other er intern to help him with a with a caravan, and, um, <laughs> and we we were driving two writers to Philadelphia. Uh, I think it was Penn State and UPenn, and um, I was maybe twenty. And he said to me, "So you're going to navigate, right?" And I didn't even know how to drive, but I said yes <laughs> because he was my boss. Um, and he tossed the map to me and, uh, for however long that day was, it was very, very long. He screamed at me the whole way up, the whole way back. And I was struggling to read the map and we'd pass the exit and I'd be pointing and he'd be like, <laughs> what, what speak, see, so did we, were we supposed to get off there? Because I didn't realize then that, that. Curtis felt nervous about navigating and driving. So, you know, it was the most, one of the most stressful things I've ever lived through. And, um, you know, we, but, but he let me read at, um, I think at UPenn because I was a spoken word poet and he let me go up after the other writers and read a poem. And that was, that was huge. It was a huge, uh, a huge moment for me. Um, and then we made it back, I don't know how, in one piece. And I'm sure that the two writers, they were two South Asian um, writers, two South Asian poets. I'm sure they thought we were crazy, um, but we got them home safe and we got home <laughs> safe. And I remember I got home and I, I mean, I was still sweating and I told my boyfriend, uh, Lambert, who was part of Godzilla, I said, I don't, I don't think he'll, I don't think he'll keep me on as an intern. And the next day there was a party at the workshop and I went in and Curtis was like, oh, hey, how are you? And totally as if nothing happened. And I think that our friendship was sort of forged in that, in that distress and confusion. Um, and then he asked me if I wanted to take over the reading series. So that, that is nice. something that will, I learned how to navigate after that. I never said yes again to reading a map unless I knew exactly what I was doing. Side so note, was, I don't um, drive anymore. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> yeah, I'm but, sorry. I apologize. I just, I, I know you've apologized. you've apologized yeah. many times for that, but you know, the, the, the flip side is that I attended so many programs all over the city with Curtis and I saw how he navigated community and how he was open and warm to everyone. And, and that taught me so much about, about building community. And, you know, I'll, I'll always remember all of that. Well, thank you. We had a great time together. Yeah, I think we all did. We have so many wonderful memories and so many special people. So, yes. <laughs> I knew you were going to bring that up. <laughs> no. Does anyone want to start? God, how do you pick? Let, let, let me start. You know, there, there's someone that who was in the workshop that I would never, ever, ever forget. And that's Vina Cabrero Sud, who is um, half Filipino and half Indian. In terms of identity, she just, and who lived in Jersey City and my family is in Jersey City. And I would never forget her reading. And she did it a few times. What you want from me, white boy. I will never forget what you want from me, white boy. She was such a great reader. She was such a great activist. She was with um, Youth for Philippine Action, which was this young Filipino group at that time. And whenever she read, silence in the room, everybody was listening. Every corner was quiet. And she just had such an impact that I remember then and I said, that's what I want to be when I grew up. And I actually emulated that kind of reading that I would never read in public unless I knew that everyone is listening to me. 
I would never read until I know that they're listening to me. And it was a power of that piece. You know, it, she didn't stay with us very long, but I will always remember it. And that's, I, I think that piece is in, in, the, is in the heart. It's one of the poems there. I, I will check. But yeah, that was a moment for me that the power of what the power of reading meant. You know, it's, it, me it meant community. It meant engagement. It meant activism. Thank you, Vina. I actually think I, my I don't memory know. has to do with Bino's. Wait, can I talk about Bino and how much it was actually the one of our early readings was the Vincent Chin reading where, you know, again, I grew up in the rural, rural, in the rural area. I majored in econ at Brown. And also, even though Brown's very liberal, the Asian American history was not part of like any of my education. And so the Vincent Chin case kind of blew my mind. Wait, what? They just killed him? And wait, they paid $2,000? People like this don't go to jail? I was so completely traumatized and freaked out by the whole thing. And so I think we had almost like a workshop about the Vincent Chin before, I think before we decided we were going to do a reading. And Bino, you did a poem, and, a, and again, I don't know anything about poetry either. I was an econ major. I did econometrics. Um, so I didn't know anything about poetry, so I was feeling a little bit like, I don't know how poetry works or anything. But you did this reading, and part of it was there was like a refrain, like a TikTok refrain of this bomb about to go off. And I, do you remember this, Bino? Do you remember this poem of yours? It, part of it the was tick like TikTok. Boom? Yes. And I just tick, remember tick, sort of this, it just kind of like, blew my mind thinking, I don't know anything about poetry, but it was just this coalescence between like activism and poetry and language and then being able to read it well that made me feel like, oh wow, this can actually like move some kind of cultural dial, even though I don't I didn't understand how poetry worked. Like I had no idea like what kind of was it a sonnet? I have no idea what it was. But just <laughs> that was just such a powerful moment for me thinking, oh, you know what? I don't have to get a PhD in poetry to understand how this works or how this moves me. I just know how it, that it moves me. And then just, I was so proud the other day because when I was doing this research about the workshop to do this thing at Columbia, um, I found this thing on the Brown University site saying that the Asian American right workshop is like a political organization. It's an activist organization. And I just thought, yes, that's what yes. we were. Like, we were deeply literary, but that is also, we were, we were an activist organization. It just made me so happy to see college students writing that today. It really moved me because mm -hmm. I thought, oh, okay, great. They get it. So there. Mm -hmm. So it was you, Bino. <laughs> I, use, I, I use this every day because I'm on Zoom every day. Instead I love of that. Doing this. That's a great. <laughs> oh, Thank Christine. you, Marie. I don't have. Curtis, do you want to go? Yeah, I can go. Um, I don't have a specific piece because there was so many or a specific person. Um, I feel like there's so many other great people. It's like it's like it's like the Oscars where you don't want to like forget huh. naming somebody. So I'm hesitant. I'm like, oh, I want to mention all these other people that we didn't mention. But if I do that, then if I don't mention somebody, um, then uh, they'll feel upset. So I'll just acknowledge so many people went through the doors of the workshop. And so I won't say that there's an actual um, reading or person, but I will say an event, which is when we got our space on St. Mark's, because. I felt like that was the culmination of all of our hopes and dreams for the last three or four years, our first three or four years, where we literally, you know, had to scramble to find space to do the things that we wanted to do, where we, we, we did rent an office, but it was a really small office. We really couldn't invite the public. Do you know what I mean? And so I felt like once we got to the St. Mark's place, we really were a community space out in, like you said, Christina, public, where people could pass by St. Mark's and see a sign that said St. Mark, Asian American Writers Workshop. What's that? You know what I mean? Um, and just being in that space several nights a week, and you know this, you know, uh, Nancy, we were, we were really organizing as many as three or four public events, you know, every week. Um, and anybody that wanted to come use the space, we said yes to. And just this idea that we could provide that opportunity for all these artists, whether you were 
you know, new and just starting out to even established authors who would come to us and ask for help. Because as you guys all know, no matter what stage you are in your career as a writer, you always need help. It doesn't matter how big you are, you always need help. And the fact that the workshop could provide that for anybody, I think for me is probably the most gratifying experience is that, you know, um, we gave opportunities to people, you know, um, on a regular basis. And I think for me, that's the greatest thing that I, I'll always think about, you know, the workshop. So. Oh, and I have to yeah. add just geographically, they, I don't know if you remember, Chris, looking at the spaces was like us versus New York City real estate. Do you remember we looked at some oh, yeah. place in like somewhere in Chinatown? I said, Curtis, we cannot. You were like, oh, I think this used to be a fabric factory. I was like, there is still cotton stuff floating in the air. We're all going to get cotton lung or whatever. Do you remember we just saw some of the craziest spaces? You know, we had a budget. So the old Crunch Fitness thing in St. Mark's was like a miracle to me. Well, the only reason we got that was because I, I, uh, worked out a deal with the landlord and i said well you know we are a nonprofit. you can donate to us instead and so uh, you know the owner so seemed to buy my argument so he donated That's thousands brilliant. of dollars to us every year that we just yeah so no that was because that was a humongous space there was no way we could beautiful. afford it you know at the rate but it's only because something clicked in my head and said hey you know what why don't you just be a donor to us you know what i mean and they agreed. So it, it teaches you sometimes it's okay to ask the crazy questions because you never know, you might get a yes. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I think for me, um, there, there's so many moments that I remember. I mean, I remember just little parties we would have and, you know, we, you know, like many parties and we would meet each other at different parties. And, um and so that is in my in the in my mind um you know the the meetings at dojo but aside from that moment i had when i read um curtis's poem um because that was actually like wow like i i can actually understand poetry it can actually matter to me you know it was like one of those moments yeah, 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 yeah. um because i always thought like poetry was kind of like for white people um and then like being in this group i was like wow like this is really moving, like uh, it really matters, right? So um, that really changed me a lot. But I would say there are two things that stand out in my mind a lot. One was when we were actually putting together in the heart, the, the first journal, and um, we were at someone's apartment and I still remember it really vividly because we were actually taking turns editing and we would pass it to the next person and and they would go through and then I guess a, there was a guy who was his name was Brian he was in he was doing all the graphics and um and then we would we would do rounds and rounds of it and there was a one piece we, we took pretty much any piece um but there was one piece that was like just really it was just misogyny like for me I was like I I, I just couldn't even believe it. And I remember at first I was like, should I even say anything? Cause um, no one wants to hear me say anything. Like, you know, they just, you know, they'll be mad or whatever, right? But then I was like, you know, I, I can't honestly not say something. And so there was that fear of like saying, speaking up, but like getting s potentially squelched down, right? But I remember I, I did say something and um, and I had asked this writer if, if he could, you know, work on it so that it didn't feel so flat and and the outward misogyny wasn't so bad. <laughs> uh, he ended up not wanting to put his piece in, in, in the heart, um, but it was the first time that I felt safe saying what I believed, I think, in that kind of environment, right? So that really, for me, was really big. And it really mattered later because I ended up going to um, Tin House and at Tin House, there were like, I was the only person of color there. And um, so if I hadn't actually spoken up before and learned how to 
to use that muscle, I don't think I would have been able to, to actually use, do that later, right? I, there would have been a lot of, you know, insecurity and, and, and that stuff, but it, so this whole period was really me developing myself and getting stronger as a person and not just as a writer, but, you know, all around. Can I just add one thing? Uh, a moment that made me cry was reading Troublemaker and Other Saints. <laughs> I think when I, when I read Christina's book, it was a time I thought we did something. I, I wouldn't even say that for myself, but, but when, I, when I read Christina's book and I know, and I, I couldn't see the voyage of that person, it was like my proudest, 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 proudest moment. And that was in the early, you know, 2001, you said you published? Nope. Yeah, and I, I just remember, because at that time I was facing out of the workshop and going on my own. But I knew that we did something incredible when I saw that, when I saw it. And I was so proud to actually give her the workshop award. I don't know what year. I was mistaken was for Reggie Capito in 2001, yeah. And and Christina screamed in the in the audience. And she, Alvin, this <laughs> <laughs> is my legal. Name. So sick. nobody knows me that. <laughs> I just announced it to the. I just I just congratulations to all of you. I know you have projects coming up, but the first one is always the best. <laughs> yeah, I think I think what's so uh, wonderful about this group is that we kind of grew up together, uh, not just our writing, but just as people. And you know, we've been able to watch each other grow and develop, and and do the things that we believe. And um, you know, the political aspect of the of the workshop was so fundamental to who we are and what we what we've done since then, and. I don't think we could have gotten that anywhere else. The other thing I would say is, I, I, I don't know if people would be surprised to hear th this, but um, the four of us are still friends today. We still talk regularly. I mean, you know, uh, like every week even. So um, I don't know, would that be surprising to, for people to know that, that through all these years? I mean, yeah, there have been gaps where we didn't talk to each other, but overall it's been pretty consistent, you know, for 30 years that we've been a part of each other's lives, which is, I think, been nice. Um, so, yeah. I have to mention when um, Carl, when Carl, my husband and I were visiting LA, Carl had a book out and that Curtis and his husband drove to two different events in LA, which I find the ultimate expression of love. I told Carl, wait, I would not go to two different events <laughs> in different parts of LA. And it just made me feel like, yeah, you know, we've always had each other's backs. And I think that's a that's kind of a rare and beautiful thing that you can have friends and we don't have to, you know, hang out. We don't hang out every day like we did, but we always, we do have this understanding. We have each other's backs. And I think there's going to be more work that's going to be created. And it just, it's kind of, and when you know other people's history and you've shared it, that's for, that's really, really special. Don't worry, Marie, I didn't drive to those two events. It was Jeff, my husband, who drove. That wasn't the prerequisite. I had to find someone who drove. That was one of my right. marriage requirements. You have to drive. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so I can't believe two hours have just flown by and I mean to be honest I feel like we just scraped the surface um I mean I have more questions and I would you know I would even though uh I have seen it to be reminded of in the heart makes me like want to hold it again and makes me want to find a way to share it um with the world again so um you know thank you for doing this I think you're all talking about your impact, the workshop's impact on you and your friendships uh, impact on, on, on each other. But, you know, these small things have had reverberations um, across the world. And 
you know, what you did together has helped so many people. And I hope that, you know, I hope people see this and um, gain something from being able to hear your stories and see your faces. Um, and I hope it's really just the beginning of you all telling this story because we're in an important time. And there are a lot of young people that would find comfort in, in hearing, hearing the story and hearing from each of you. So I wanna thank you all for being here and for being our first conversation and sort of working out all of these um, little kinks. Um, but I, I, I personally want to keep following up with you and however we can do that through the series um, supporting your stories. Um, we're, we're here for that. So thank you. And, um, uh, thanks for being you and thanks for what you gave me as a, as a person, not, not even just as a writer. Nancy, you so can I just say one curation? Thing? Yeah, this is yeah. awesome. And I think the one takeaway for me when I see my friends is, is that if you do what you believe and you just keep just just do it without thinking too much about like all the difficulties of it that you can get where you want to go um and and you can't think of it in terms of having to get someplace you just have to just do it and just do keep trudging along doing what you believe and, and then you end up like marie with with this incredible book that's 30 years old right it's, mm. it, and you and didn't it's, have to pay for its, it's college education. First. Yes. <laughs> you know, that's how short Asian American history is, too. So, yeah. Thank okay. You, well, thank you all. Thank you. This was a fantastic thank conversation. You. You're masterful, Nancy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks for the opportunity. In the heart. In the heart. <laughs> In the heart. <laughs> I want one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.